So as believers, we are often faced with this dichotomy of living in the world, living out of the world, the political nature and landscape and how it's ever evolving. And at the rapid pace that we are experiencing so much change right now, I feel like it's very hot on the press and hot on our minds, so to speak, of what we as millennials, as Christians are dealing with. And so I want to jump into this because there was a little bit of fiery exchange between me and someone else on the social spaces because I made a comment about Christians needing to care about the political landscape. So clearly there's a way that we need to bridge this gap in understanding. And I want to talk through it a little bit with you guys because, I mean, this is an ever-evolving, you know, arena, so to speak. And it's important for us to have dialogue about it. It's getting more intense and there's a lot of vitriol, vitriol around the subject of politics and Christians and where do we fit into this and what should we be devoting our time and energy toward. We're jumping into this today on the Thought Vault Podcast. Welcome to the Thought Vault, everybody. Let's get into it. As a conservative Christian millennial grappling with the complexities of this world's political landscape, you might find yourself wrestling with these, you know, deeply personal and vulnerable questions. Like, how can I reconcile my Christian values with the political and social issues that seem to contradict or challenge those beliefs? And what advice would you give to Christians struggling to see God's hand in today's world event? So these questions are tenuous because it's like, the sphere between faith and public life. And it's a topic that is quite frequently explored by theologians and philosophers and political scientists. From a Christian perspective, the Bible offers a lot of engaging guidance on how to maintain our faith in, wor in the world, like the verse that this podcast is founded on, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. This verse is showing us a path forward, engaging critically with the world, informed by a Christian worldview, but not accepting just anything that's normal in society that's going to conflict with our deeply held beliefs. And that's where the friction tends to lie, because philosophically, we can be like, oh, well, you know, Everyone has their own beliefs and their own way of moralizing and, and doing the things that they choose to do in life and decision making. But we also have to hold true as believers to what God says. And that's where this conversation is so important. And I think why people get up in arms about it. There's such a group of people that just want to be ostriches, stick their hand in the sand and just simply say, well, God calls us to accept and love everyone. We don't need to engage in all this strife because they see our political landscape as pure conflict. And while that's totally understandable, that is not an excuse to not care about what's going on in policy because policy impacts how we live our daily life. If we care about people as we should as believers, well, of course we should care about policy because it's impacting how we live. Therefore, it should be of importance to us. I think the problem with a lot of people is it's hard for them to be in a political sphere or try to dip their toe into caring about it because it can so quickly consume you and easily become an idol. I love the old adage, like there's things you just don't talk about, money and politics and religion. And I'm not saying for you to go out and have all these conversations, but you do have to care. So whether you engage in conversation, whether you decide to take part and take action in certain things, that's, that's one area. But to simply not care and not keep up with it, I feel like you're doing a disservice to yourself and what I would think God would expect from us because we need to care about what society is doing. I mean, Jesus literally is engaging with the government, the policy of his age by being in contact with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the rabbis and like talking to these people and engaging with them because he knows the importance and the influence they have over the community. And that's why he spends a lot of time trying to correct what they've done wrong. And 
help people have a better understanding of truly how to be more like him and where policy and judgment and all that stuff should lie and ultimately who is the creator of all that and how we should live by it. So it is of importance and you don't have to be an activist to care about politics, but informing yourself, you should take as a responsibility so that you can make informed decisions. Because as cliche as it sounds, your vote does count. Like everyone's vote does count. And you don't know what types of conversations you would have with people just in normal daily conversations if you kept up with that type of stuff. So I'm more speaking to the person who's like not, is choosing not to care about politics at all and just staying out of it. I don't think that's a correct place or posture for Christians to be. Uh, we should care. And I would never suggest idolizing these things. But you should care. And I think it's helpful to encourage your children, your loved ones, for them to care about it, knowing what that healthy balance and boundary is. When you hear Christian philosophers like Augustine, Aquinas, and even more contemporary thinkers like philosophers of our century, there's one, his name is Alastair McIntyre. I might not be pronouncing that right, but he's well known for a book he wrote called After Virtue, where he discusses the importance of moral communities and maintaining ethical integrity in a fragmented modern world. He suggests that individuals find true fulfillment and moral coherence within communities that share their fundamental values. Hello. So yes, you might not be able to control what everyone ultimately decides to do or policy that ultimately gets put in place. But the community that you live in does matter and it does impact your life. And so you're seeing people right now in our own country make mass moves across the country just to go somewhere where they feel is more accepting, more comfortable, more in line with what they believe. People make choices like this all the time. So it does impact the health and wealth of communities and wealth meaning it could mean actual wealth money wise, monetarily, but it also just the quality of life, if you will. So, of course, people are going to make choices about their life based on that and based on the community that they live in. So it is something that impacts everyone. And we find that people that are most happy, most fulfilled are when they are connected to community, which we know is important to Jesus because his whole part of his whole mission here was to teach us how to connect to one another and what that means and why it's our great commission to go and connect with other people to help be the light of Christ and bring others to the light of Christ, right? And to be engrafted into the heavenly kingdom and heavenly family. And the realm of political theory, the concept of principled pluralism advocated by thinkers like Jonathan Chaplin in Talking God, his book, Talking God, The Legitimacy of Religious Public Reasoning. He offers a way for Christians to engage in public discourse. Chaplin argues for the participation of religious perspectives in the public square, emphasizing that such engagement should be characterized by respect for the diversity of convictions within a democratic society. This approach encourages Christians to articulate their beliefs in a manner that contributes constructively to the common good while also being open to learn from others. The question of how to reconcile Christian values with contemporary political and social issues is both complex and very deeply personal. I totally agree. So it's a complex issue, but again, there's something I heard that I thought was a great way of putting it. The step, you know, you hear people all the time, especially people that are not Christians and are tired, are sick of hearing our viewpoints about things, say things like, you know, separation of church and state. What happened to that? That's what our country is founded on. But the founders of our country were Christians. You cannot deny that. And when you have that understanding, then you realize that the separation of church and state was to protect the church, not the state. A little backstory to my family is I grew up in a house divided because back when uh, the parties were very close in proximity to their policies and what they valued. And you can look at political graphs and it's well documented. I mean, the margin that they were different was not very far. One side of my family had what they valued and how they lived and being involved in politics. They were on one side, my, my other side of my family was on the other. I grew up seeing both sides. I grew up understanding this side and understanding this side. So it was very fun around the political season because we got in heated arguments. And I heard heated arguments. I was a kid, but I heard heated arguments about both sides. But it very much helped me have an understanding of being open to what other people's opinions are and understanding policy, how it's made, what it truly does, how it truly does impact different things and which better aligned with certain 
elements of life, like certain beliefs and things like that. So people have so much, so many different paradigms of the hand that government should have in life and like how many, how much government should control, how much they shouldn't and all, all the stuff. And so I bring that up because we do need to, of course, have a willingness to hear other sides and have an empathetic approach to where, what's the backstory of this. And so that's what I encourage anyone. It's like, we have Christian values, of course, but there's other people in this world who are not of Christian values. And so our understanding of how to live together is important. And that's why we have to hear each other out. But here's the thing. There is no way to separate someone's, and it shouldn't be. You, you should not separate your convictions from the way that you vote or get, you know, active in your community over these types of things. So to say that, you know, separation or church and state and that be an argument, it's just, it's kind of silly to me because of course a person's moral convictions and their religion, their upbringing, all these factors about who they are will and should impact how they vote. So of course you're not going to separate a Christian from the way they vote. You shouldn't do that. And Christians should be voting. You shouldn't just remove yourself from it. That's what they would love is to remote, remove us from the picture because we vote how we feel convicted. We vote with what we're aligned with. It's an interesting conversation. And I feel like not enough Christians talk about this. I don't necessarily want to hear everyone's viewpoints, but I think it's important that in this day state of things, that Christians are encouraged to be involved in simply just casting your vote. And so the best way to do that is to be informed and to be abreast of what's going on. That's important. It's important to know. When we're trying to deal with this connection, we should obviously be turning to scripture and having this engagement with people and navigate these challenges in a way that is faithful to our convictions and the truth and the morals that we have and the values that we hold. And it's responsive, and we, we approach it with a responsiveness to the needs of the broader society. So we're not just coming to it with, you know, like blinders on, and we're not willing to not compromise or un have at least the ability and willingness to hear. But just because we hear something doesn't mean we have to let go of our conviction over that. We should be able to have a strong enough faith, a bold enough faith, an emboldened faith to stand on our convictions. And we see that exemplified in Jesus. He was able to have conversations with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Sometimes they got heated, but regardless, he stood his ground. He was emboldened in what he knew was true, but he didn't shy away from the conversations. And that's very important because the world is lost and we know that there is a single truth. We should have our voice in that. We, our voice should be out there to help people have an assuredness that there is a truth. So if we're willing to sit and have dialogue, hopefully they can see us by example doing that and they will be have a willingness to sit and listen. We should be strong enough in our own conviction, our own understanding of the Lord that we're not, we're not scared into silence. If I'm asked point blank a topic, I say what I believe. When I'm asked by those who are interested and want to know, I explain. And I'm emboldened because I know that I'm speaking from truth and I have the truth of God. I have the Holy Spirit dwelling within me. And so I can speak on these things if I'm asked directly. I think that's where we have to, as believers, be okay and willing to step into the conversation. I don't want to project what I think would Je Jesus would do, but from reading scripture, I know that he was very passionate about the truth of God, what God says, what God values. And he explained that when asked, and he was willing to dialogue when the conversation was brought to his feet. He did not shy away, and he stood his ground. And when necessary, he asked the questions. He made bold statements. And I don't ever believe he was looking for conflict, but did some of the things he say conflict with society? Yes, clearly. He had to die for that. So staying informed about important things is important and Christians should engage thoughtfully with the world around us. And it's crucial to maintain our spiritual peace amidst the chaos of it and the noise of the news. And so I wanted to share with you guys some strategies to help you battle this out a little bit and 
stay balanced and focused. And if you haven't already, I'm going to pause right here and say, please subscribe to the show. Please leave a review if you're listening to this on your podcast app. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please drop a comment, say hi, share and hit the bell so that you're notified when new episodes drop. I just want to stay connected with you all and build a like-minded faith-based community. So the first way to engage in this political arena or to stay balanced in this is to have selective engagement. So choose reliable, balanced news resources. You need to let go of the sensationalism. And as you get more abreast of doing this and like knowing who, what resources are better to go to, you can easily filter out the sensational titles, the ones that are clickbait and trying to get you to get angry and get mad and dissatisfied with the situation. I am a avid researcher. So when I give you a fact about something or a statistic, like I've double checked it, triple checked it, quadruple checked it, checked it. I like to know what I'm talking about. And I like to be ready for the questions. That's just my personality. I will look at all sides because I know from the household that I grew up in and the way I was nurtured, like if you feel strong about it, then know your stuff. And so I try to know my stuff and I like to look at all different resources. And that's very important because if you don't do that, it's so easy to get caught in an echo chamber as the term is coined now with social media, where you are, you're only hearing one side of things and that can cause such a false narrative in your heart and in your mind about reality. And with AI, the reality that we have known is going bye-bye. And so we have to have and engage our God-given discernment. That's very important. So you need to be looking at different resources and limit your news consumption to certain times of the day. Like it doesn't need to be a constant exposure to the news because it will make you very depressed and very depleted. I know I've fallen down that rabbit hole several times in the last six years from the whole circumstance we've all been through and what we're facing now. So I know what it can be like to get in the rabbit hole. It's very depressing. So don't do that. Limit your time. The other strategy is prayerful consumption. So before and after consuming news, this is a key, key tool is spend time in prayer. So ask God to give you discernment and peace regarding the information that you're reading. If we know something's happening, we can pray about it. And there's so much missed opportunity to pray over things that really impact other people's lives, impact your own life. And just the power of prayer is amazing. Being in prayer as a community is such a gift from God. And I love this tool because I didn't really do this before. Like I, I wouldn't really pray about world events. Yes, if something happened across my eyes, I would be like, I would say a prayer. But to continually pray over something is, is so insightful and brings a lot of wisdom too. Because if you're following something and you're reading about it and you're seeing how it plays out in real time, there's just a different element to that. And you feel involved when you know that you're calling on God's name and knowing the power of God. Uh, so praying about the news that you're consuming, it's a very good thing. So do that and use it again as a way to prompt yourself in prayer and, and emboldening your prayer life. The other strategy is scriptural anchoring. So what I mean by this is anchor yourself in scripture. The Bible offers wisdom and peace that transcends all the craziness. So let biblical principles guide your understanding in response to the news. Know that God is, he is the almighty. He is, I am. He has sovereignty over the world. There's a lot of things I've wrestled with with my faith. I will continue to because it's hard in our flesh to understand why certain things are happening. It's easy to go down the, the path of asking God, why? Why is this happening? Why would you allow this to happen? And we have these big question. But again, this goes back to building that robust prayer life in connection to God through that and through being connected to what is happening around us. Because we don't have all the answers and we can't assume to know what God is thinking or why things are happening. We do know that we live in this world that is broken and fallen and there is free will. We know that God has sovereignty and things happen, but God is not the orchestrator of evil. Satan is. God is here to redeem what is broken and what is destroyed. We can lean on God to draw closer to him. That teaches us a lot about who he is. There are a lot of wild, unbelievably hard situations in scripture and see how God redeems that. See how God is working through that. And it brings hope to us. And I live in hope. And that's why the truth that we have to share to the world is so important because we offer hope to the world to the broken souls, to the people who are going to live in an eternity that no one would want to live in. So 
if we can offer hope to them and help them to have a faith that brings that peace that they are so searching for, we can do that by staying engaged. So that's why we need to be knowing the world and in the world, but not of it. So the other strategy of this is to be in discussion. I've mentioned that a lot, but being able to have dialogue with people that are think di- that think differently than you, that are asking the tough questions, put yourself, insert yourself into the conversation respectfully and as God would prompt you to. Call on his name to say, God, is this something I should talk about? Is this, is this something I should stay silent on? You know, sometimes it's best to listen. Sometimes uh, not speaking is the best wisdom you can offer people. And it's just a very wild ride to insert yourself into this dialogue. But it's necessary as believers because our voice must be in this conversation. It needs to be. And we should be proud of that because we have a lot to offer this world and this society and uh, that shouldn't be looked past. And you're also going to find a lot of support in that because there, you'll, there will be a lot of people that actually do think like you. They want us to believe that no one thinks like us anymore, that we need to be in the margins, we're in the fringe. And that's just simply not true because goodness and moral code, morality is written on our heart by our creator. We were all created in his image. So everyone knows good versus evil. And as much as they would try to shade in things with gray, good prevails, God prevails. They're seeking to know that. And a lot of people will support your perspective as a Christian, especially if you are approaching them in a Christ-like manner. So it can be a challenge to discern God's presence and purpose in difficult times like this. And if we trust in God's sovereignty, we remind ourselves that God is sovereign over all the events. His ways are higher than our our ways as it's spoken to in Isaiah 55, eight, verses 8 and 9. And he is at work, even in ways we cannot see or understand. Look for his helpers. There are always people around us doing good work and making big impacts. Look for those people because that is a testament to God moving. And it's so easy to look in the news and say, there's nothing good in the news. Like where, where is God? And there is a lot of good news out there. I promise you. And I love reading the good stories. I love hearing the miracles. I love seeing the stuff that is happening that God is doing. His evidence is all around us. Reflect on how God has worked through history, both in biblical times and in recent history. There's so much, as I said before, in scripture that still shows <laughs> that God is present in all of the chaos. Being engaged in what is happening in our political sphere does impact our world greatly. We can see that. We can see what's ha- transpired in the last two years and the forecast for what's to come. It's very unsettling. And that's the gift that we believers being in the dialogue offer. We offer a stability and a peace. And that's a gift. And that's the gift of hope. So I hope that today gave you something to think about. I hope that this conversation has given you something to ruminate on and to encourage you to be emboldened in your faith and be emboldened in your positions and your convictions and your truth because you might hurt someone's feelings. But if you're speaking in truth from the love of God, there is fruit and harvest to be reaped from that and God will get the glory. And there's a right way and a wrong way to go about it. Read scripture, read how Jesus handled himself. That will explain to you exactly what roads to take and lean on prayer to give you discernment when you're reading about the news, reading about the policy. It can be very, a lot of legalese jargon that's hard to understand, but continue, press on and press forward and just take responsibility for knowing what's going on and as involved as you get in it, be prompted by the Lord in that. Always be led by God's prompting. So if that's casting your vote, that's good. You've made an informed decision by staying aware. If it's prompting to get you activated into the community somehow and in some form or fashion, do that. But lean on God's understanding first and foremost. It's good work to be involved in what's going on in our world. It's what we're called to do. So I would be curious to hear your thoughts about this and make sure to click the link in the show notes to get into our community group. It's a free group. And I look forward to rolling out even more resources for you all in the coming months. And until next time, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. 
Go live with bold intention, everyone. Bye for now.